Welcome to Mindful Social Chat, everyone. I'm really excited to have Laura on. We've been friends for a long time and we've met, oh gosh, I don't even know when we met, but it was a long time ago in some nonprofit universe. And yeah. uh, you know, I've I've admired her as a human being for a long time, and she is just amazing. So with that intro, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Laura? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think it was just about a year ago that we did a uh, mindful social Twitter chat. So, yeah, sometimes uh, the history of our relationship pops up on social media, <laughs> which is not sure where it all began. So, um, well, I work for ETR, which is um, a nonprofit that's focused on health education especially in areas of teen pregnancy prevention, HIV prevention and risk reduction. Um, we also focus on STEM opportunities for underprivileged youth and underrepresented populations. Um, we don't do direct service. What we do is create evidence-based curricula that we train teachers and train trainers to train teachers and youth group organizers to deliver. Mm. Um, another thing we do, I would say maybe like a third of our staff are scientists and researchers who get grants from big organizations like the National Science Foundation, the CDC, to study things in those areas. Um, and then another little side aspect, not side aspect, but a aspect of the business that's a little bit different is just publishing health information pamphlets like the kind you would pick up at Planned Parenthood or a health clinic or your doctor. Hmm. And over the years, um, ETR used that little portion of what they do to help sustain the grant funded work because grant work ebbs and flows. Other organizations have to let their staff go when a grant ends. And we try to keep people on you know, that was kind of a revenue stream. We're a nonprofit, so we put all that money back into sustaining um, staff and, and growing operations and that kind of thing. So so we have kind of all these different areas and things that we do. So as a communications person, and we have a very small communications team, um, uh, we have to speak to all these different audiences. They're very, very different. So that's one of the interesting challenges that I get to face. Um, so yeah, I'm the digital media strategist there. So I, I try to plan out our strategy, but because we're small, I do a lot of implementation too. So I write and design and send out all the emails and do all the data tracking on that. Um, I do most of the social. Marsha, who I think was maybe joining us, is our editor who writes the blog, and she also does all the tweeting now. She she was my Twitter protege. Who there now, she is. She says she's you know, here. Hi, Marsha. <laughs> and yeah, she is now a Twitter expert in her own right, I think. Uh, and then sure. kind of the other thing, uh, Marsha will definitely attest to this, is that we both do is we try to evangelize social media to the rest of the staff, especially the um, scientists who and researchers who they're just they do amazing incredible work they're publishing all these papers they're really passionate about the work they do bridging research into practice um you know but they forget or don't realize or don't have time to have a social media presence so we're trying to change that mm -hmm. so in your work uh how much are you using a content calendar? Is that something that's crucial, especially since, you know, even though you're a small team, do you and Marsha use a content calendar together? Yeah, we do. We um, experimented with some different things. Um, you know, one of the things we can do with that is, is we can share it with our boss to show a calendar of things. But we started out trying to use SharePoint because we're a Microsoft organization. Mm -hmm. Be sad for us. But <laughs> although we're going 365 now, so we're in the transition. Um, but so we started out trying to use SharePoint, which for me, it was pretty cool in some ways because I could overlay it with my regular daily other work stuff calendar. But Marsha was on a Mac. 
Mm. And it wasn't like she had to go to the web version to do it. And so we did that for a while. It was, you know, it was good. But then we switched over to Trello and Trello has been really cool. Mm. It's such a versatile tool and it's really fun. And you can, you know, you can set up data flows in and out. We haven't done as much with that, but we definitely could. And you can create lots of different views and different. So yeah, Trello has been great. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's, I can go in and see where she's at in the process of what's about to get published. Mm -hmm. And I think it's published. I add a little checklist, make sure I've done all the social promotion. So let's talk about that a little bit more. How does, what does workflow look like with the content calendar? I mean, I think in some ways, um, one of the biggest things is using it to take a step back, right? And, mm -hmm. and look at your bigger goals. Um, and that uh, is some yearly planning you can do or quarterly planning. But yeah, as far as the day-to-day -day flow, it's nice because anyone can jump in and contribute, say, an idea for a blog post, right? Mm. It doesn't have to just be me and Marsha. I mean, we, I, I wouldn't say we've succeeded yet at it, inviting other people in. But say someone comes up with an idea, you meet them in the hallway, you know, and they're like, well, maybe I can do this. You can add it to the, you know, column with blog, blog post ideas. And then, so it is, it's just a very, um, very intuitive interface and very easy to look at. And there's all kinds of fun things you can do with color coding. So, we're, you know, I was saying we have all these different audiences. We also have four different areas of um, kind of topic focus. Mm -hmm. So one is the sexual and reproductive health and there's um, alcohol, tobacco and drug because we have a large grant that focuses on tobacco prevention um, and uh, so there's these different areas and, you know, the youth in IT or the, un, the, the STEM, encouraging diversity in STEM. Mm -hmm. So what, what I'm experimenting now with is taking all the past blog posts, because they're all in Trello, and moving them over to another cal calendar and putting little color coding on which topic are we covering so that I can see, you know, are we covering all these important areas that we want to cover equally. And then, you know, I could lay data on top of that. How is it, how are they performing? Mm -hmm. So. So kind of using Trello as a way to track the, the performance of the content and, and get a better 10,000 foot view. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how can we think about that in a mindful way you know when we're talking about our constituents or we're talking about uh you know doing marketing outreach and as you said it sounds like there's a lot of segmentation that you need to do how does right. how does that play into really taking a mindful approach to how we use our content and and how to, what does the calendar do for you mm -hmm. Well, I don't know so much the calendar, but it, but um, I mean, that would be part of it is, is trying to hit things evenly or hit things during the right time of year. You know, mm -hmm. we just had a big teen pregnancy prevention conference for grantees. Um, but another thing that happens, I think, is the difference between, you know, I was just going, it's just looking at some stuff that Beth Cantor had been talking about. She's got this great book, Measuring the Networked Nonprofit. Yay, Beth. Yeah. And um, so it, she actually talks about, she's like, well, I don't like to say data driven. I like to say data informed. Mm. And that kind of resonates with me because where I, I don't like to just be driven by the data of, oh, how many hits did, you know, this link get? Because I track everything with Bitly, say. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, how many likes did we get on this post, blah, blah, blah. What I like to figure out is which audience were we trying to hit? You know, I can't always tell for sure if we're hitting that audience, but each audience is going to have a different metric. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, I just did a follow-up email to the 
attendees of this teen pregnancy prevention conference. And it was a small email, like 680, 700 people. But I got like a 36% open rate. Nice. So I was like, yeah, this is, I've got the right people. I'm giving them the right message. And then with some of our other emails, I might be marketing our educational pamphlets and the mailing list is a little bit older and bigger and funky. And so if I get a smaller metric opens or clicks for that, I'm not necessarily going to be disappointed, mm -hmm. you know? So each, each, I guess each goal you have, you need to be mindful of what the metric is. Mm -hmm. And different voices as well as that, you know, I, th I think that's part of, you know, really thinking about your content and, and who those different audiences are and crafting content that's going to work for them. Because, you know, if you have, uh, you know, a youth group on one hand and an age group on the other hand, then, you know, how do we create content and how do we manage that content so that we're not, you know, using hip hop jargon for a bunch of old farts like us? Right, right. Yeah. And I, I think to some extent, um, you'll see that on our blog, most of our stuff is more geared toward this, the science audience or the people who are concerned with the research base of the practice. Mm -hmm. But then we have um, lighter things where we're talking maybe to um, school teachers or you know we don't we don't have too many things that hit the actual youth because we're like one step removed from the organizations who work with youth uh -huh. uh, but sometimes we do give voice to uh youth who do things like peer-to-peer -peer sex ed and really just fun cool things like that um so yeah it, it i think it can be tricky um having all those different things to hit but but just bringing that to each post be right, you know, who is the audience going to be mm -hmm. and trying to bring the voice into that. And we have a lot of guest writers too. So again, Marsha is our wizard of kind of, you know, turning the tone into one that's going to suit the right audience. Mm. So if you're creating content for a specific audience, you know, I, I assume that listening to what they say, how they say it, what kind of topics they want to do, want to want to discuss in particular. Um, does that, how do you, how do you do that? How do you create that content that's, you know, is going to resonate with them? Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is, um, I want to say like industry specific or, you know, that's, that's not the nonprofit term, but um, we kind of know what, what are on people's minds from conferences that we go to the, the papers that people publish. There's this thing called the YRBS, the, the youth uh, hmm. survey that comes out quarterly. And so, a lot of listening, you know, the CDC has gotten really good at tweeting, actually. And there's some um, interesting people that we follow there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so definitely um, listening more and talking less, you know, <laughs> waiting till we do have that kind of signal. What are people talking about? Affirmative consent has been a huge issue for us. We have a, a yes means yes pamphlet and poster and and uh, some articles on that. So yeah, kind of rolling, rolling with the times. And, and watching, watching the news. I was just on a, forget an echo, I don't know if that's me or you. Um, I was just on a chat, a content chat, and they were talking about, you know, where do you get the trends to develop content? Um, you know, is it Facebook trending news? Are there tools that you use to try to find out what else is going on out there so that you can keep as current as possible? Um, definitely certain, you know, we try to collect hashtags as a group. We'll look around and try to figure out which hashtags are relevant to our fields. And I sometimes I do just kind of take the time to really go down that road and see, well, 
who are the influencers or the authoritative voices who are and what hashtags are they using for a certain thing? Mm. And then once we have that, we can listen. And, you know, Marcia uses TweetDeck. I use TweetDeck. Uh, so we can set up columns to listen for that. Um, I'm trying to think what else. But, yeah, Facebook, you know, I, again, I, I kind of, on the one hand, we've all got, more than just even communications. Like I've got some other jobs like the managing the Pardot Salesforce integration and the databases. So I try to make things really efficient and use things like buffer and just mm -hmm. pre schedule things. But then on the other hand, every once in a while, I'll just stop and take a moment to listen and be, be mindful and maybe build relationships in that kind of old fashioned, um, uh, social graph, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll go find an interesting, you know, maybe it's a community health center, but they happen to be very like Facebook savvy. So then I'll say, you know, who, who do they, what pages do they like? And I'll go look at, you know, and just kind of expanding that social graph, which that that's one thing I think Twitter and Facebook can be really helpful on. And because we do use Pardot, so that's our email marketing tool, mm -hmm. and it does have the, um, you know, the IP tracking. It uh, sometimes works. So if it can associate the email address with a person with an IP address, then I can see if someone's opened our emails. Sometimes I'll just go explore that. Who is this person who clicked on our emails? You know, and what kind? Where are they in the social graph? And and that. Mm -hmm. so, uh -huh. yeah. I think that kind of research is something that we often neglect. You know, uh, we kind of sign up for Twitter, we sign up for Facebook, and we create a Facebook page and then just wait for people to come. And I think that's mm -hmm. often overlooked, especially more on Facebook than on Twitter, because it's mm -hmm. actually harder on Facebook to go, okay, these are the people that have liked the page recently. You know, can we dig in and, and find out who they are and where do they live and what are their interests and how can we speak to them kind of instead of bringing our own egos into it? Um, I think that's, you know, the, the biggest marketing bugaboo is that we tend to bring our own ego into it and what we want to put out there, um, you know, more than what people want to hear. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's. Now that I, I am exposed to, uh, I'm in the Salesforce part out universe, I think that the, the B2B marketers, business to business people have got a hold of me. And so I get a lot of emails about content marketing and, you know, constantly about the tools and things. And um, I think, you know, that's one thing that maybe they don't understand as much or, you know, you, they'll throw around like the customer experience mm -hmm. that's a big buzzword or, um, uh, but I think for me, I like to go to the level of who, who is this actual, I mean, for us, it's organizations following organizations usually, you know, who, it, but then it does come down to the people. So mm. who, who these people really are, try to put myself in their shoes. What, what do they want to learn about? And what do they want to talk about? But you're right, you know, Facebook, it used to be really easy to see who followed, who, there, you know, in the early days, you can see, I think, everybody who liked a page or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot harder now. And if, if um, you know, if people are commenting and stuff or, you know, you get new likes, but but it's a lot harder there than it is on Twitter where it's very easy to research people who's following a hashtag, you know, who's participating in a Twitter chat, for example, and, you know, what relationships they have and, and make those connections. I think another interesting thing too is especially, you know, with a group like yours that deals with some things that could be pretty edgy as far as, um, you know, the conversations that go on around it, um, you know, no means no kind of 
discussions to say the least. But, you know, how do you deal with when somebody attacks you through your Twitter handle or the organization through the Twitter handle? You know, how do we how do we manage some of those things? There's been so much trolling lately. Um, yeah. You know, can can we talk a little bit about that as far as really managing your social communities? Yeah, I mean, actually, so well, in my former life, I used to do a lot of online community management at this other grant funded project, but we had a pretty controlled uh, group of, of people. So there wasn't as much of that kind of difficulty. Um, actually, the biggest problem we've had at ETR is around the uh, topic of tobacco hmm. and vape because there are very passionate uh, pro vapors who believe that it's a helpful um, uh, to smoking cessation you know, road that maybe it'll help you quit regular cigarettes. Um, but they're so, you know, and the science is still evolving on that, but so far science isn't really showing that. And especially uh, vaping among youth is really a big concern because it's almost like the next revival of, of smoking, you know, smoking has been declining so well. Uh, but when we published, um, there was an informational video about one of our uh, vaping information pamphlets and we got trolls on social media. We got people calling our customer service staff and cussing them out. I mean, just, it was scary, mm. you know? So I am, you know, I, I, I guess, again, that's one of those moments where you do want to take a step back and make sure your ego is not a part of it. You know, I, I think the obvious, right. Don't, uh, don't don't respond step back take a breath you know think about it and then we would usually come together as a group and, and pull some other people from the agency in and start discussing it but mm. I remember a lot of that was uh, there were Facebook trolls but but they you know I tried to see their side of it again some of them were had a personal story. They felt that the vaping had helped them stop smoking or something. And, um, you know, so the ones who that actually helped us revise our social media policy that, or, or the, the, uh, Facebook page policy, you know, we went back and said, you know, we will not tolerate profanity and, mm. you know, and certain kinds of just lame, you know, <laughs> useless comments. Um, but I did do some direct uh, message responses to some of those people, you know, thank you for your concerns and here's what's happening and, and responded to them that way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and Marcia says in the chat, that was hard for some of the people in our group who believe in education. They wanted to communicate with the pro vapors and explain our perspective and share our resources. And is that something that you did as, as kind of a follow-up to, or, or as a way to kind of belay the trollers, belay the trollers. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think we subtly did it with, with follow on posts, mm. but did not, you know, the, the really vitriolic comments, I think I did delete some of them. And then the other ones I just didn't respond to. And then we did some follow up posts with information, but yeah, uh, some people were like, well, why don't we just say, you know, this is, we understand, but this is how it is. But, you know, I was like, let's not feed the trolls in this yeah. case. I know it's not going to end well. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes, you know, you have to really, uh, and I, I think you said this to me when we, we had our pre-call, you know, you have to have compassion for where those people are at. Uh, yeah. You know, we know where we're at and we know what our deal is. But, you know, sometimes people have those other stories, as you said before, that, you know, make them be the way they are. And we're not going to change that with a tweet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when we went, I was I was lucky enough to go to one of the um, 
tobacco prevention grantees conference. So our big funder for that project is the California Department of Public Health. Mm. But they have all kinds of partners and other um, grantees doing all kinds of cool work. And when I went to their conference in Sacramento, I found out that this trolling stuff is a huge problem. They, you know, it's very complicated. There's the, the, these mom and pop vape shops who sell this high end equipment. That's very different than big tobacco trying to get back into the e-cigarette business. So there's these different camps, um, but there were things where people would take like a health department and create a website or something, and they were mimicking and parodying it mm. by creating this other version and just all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it can get pretty wild. So if we want to kind of convince people that, you know, we are humans on the other end of the discussion, you know, we're just trying to do the best we can and, and move our message forward. What are some good ways to do that to kind of humanize a brand of whether it's a nonprofit or an individual person? Hmm. I, I mean, for me, I think I'm just like, I'm, I can't help myself. I like to communicate. <laughs> so we're very responsive. I uh -huh. think maybe that's one thing. Um, do you, uh, I'm looking at Kathy's question. Do you guys advocate for employee personal branding? Oh yeah. Uh, I'm going to, I will address that in a minute. Yeah. I, I mean, definitely. I think in the business world, people are starting to understand more that you're speaking as a person who works for this business, you know, yes, I am, I am the business, but you know, like in our sales staff, I'm trying to encourage them to not say ETR thanks you for your order. I'm like, well, what is ETR? ETR is not a person. We can't thank you. So why don't you just say thanks? Yeah. <laughs> you know, thanks from me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but yeah, Kathy, what we do, um, for say a researcher on Twitter, we really just have them, um, yeah, we do try to have them mention our Twitter account in their little bio um, and then, but then also say like tweets are my own. So mm. it's still, you know, they can, they can kind of um, still own that handle, but have a certain professional aspect to it. And we actually do have to be pretty careful about that because some, when you're getting federal funding, for instance, you can't do advocacy work or it, it depends. There's certain types of things you can and can't do. Like um, a certain federal grants, you could not on your business time when you're working on that grant, you shouldn't also say, you know, promote a political candidate or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's some specific guidelines we try to watch out for. What about talking about the people that work for the organization, though, as, you know, doing vignettes or profiles to kind of add that level of humanity to the organization? Is that something that you do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, again, in the tobacco area, we just had a recent post that um, Narinder Dhaliwal, who runs two of our grant-funded tobacco prevention projects, wrote something um, just about her personal experience, how her grandfather was a smoker. Um, and bye, Marsha. And it was very bye, touching Marcia. how that, um, the underlying passion she has for her work came from her personal experience. And, mm -hmm. Oh, thanks for posting that. Yeah. Yeah. And so we definitely want to do more of those. And, and we've got um, all the, a lot of the people who work on teen pregnancy prevention, they've been in this business a long time and they really have a passion for it. And we have had quite a few other kind of what oh, we used to call them my take it was like the my take series on the blog and mm -hmm. so people would address uh their personal views on something like there was one where someone was talking about um 
how she was at a party and she was talking with guys about birth control, you know, and it just went into, so we, we get somewhere, there's much more of a personal slice of life. And then even, um, so those are the best because you're really getting personal stories and what, what are the goals and values behind the people doing this work? And of course, maybe that's a little easier for a nonprofit than for, um, if you're selling widgets, it might be a little harder to explain what your passion for widgets is, but mm. maybe you have one. <laughs> um, so it is a little easier for us, but it, it, it's important and it's something we want to do more of. And I also do, I try to do, I mean, it's kind of hokey alliteration, but like meet us Monday, I'll try to do schedule a bunch of Facebook posts where I introduce the, the staff and it could be anyone mm. from, you know, someone who takes orders to a high level researcher. I try to just hit all the different staff and um, yeah. So I think that kind, of stuff, that kind of stuff is really is valuable. That we get it's really, it's really um, uh, I, I just I, think it makes a lot of sense. And I'm gonna shut up now because oh wait, now I'm not on <laughs> Echo. <laughs> Oh, no, that, yeah, it was just for a second That's there. Funny. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I, th I think anything that you can do to show a personal side, and I, I know it's really hard for brands, and it's even more difficult for organizations that have, like you said, federal funding. There's a lot of things you can't say. There's a lot of things you can't do. But, you know, at the same time, we want to know who's behind the organization, and it's a lot easier to kind of, push back and, and get angry in an organization that's doing something that you don't agree with until you see a human face there. And, you know, pushing back against the logo is easier than, than a human, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm just thinking about um, what you were saying about, um, you know, these profiles, when people talk about the passion they bring to their work. Um, but I know also for just our communication strategy and for me as an employee and me in my personal life, like all these different things intersect. And what I try to do, I think this is maybe some of the mindfulness aspect of it is step back to the very beginning and think, what are my values? Hmm. What do I value in life? And then out of those values, what are my goals? Um, and so I think that's it, you know, and then from there, what are my tact strategies, tactics, blah, blah, blah. But, but go step, taking some steps back to values and goals, I think can help provide direction hmm. in business and in life. So I'm still working on that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's a nice thing to say, but you really have to kind of dig in and actually do it. So that that's something I'm doing now. Yeah, I think we have to do that on a regular basis too. You know, I, I think that a lot of times we don't step back and look at things. And even if it's, you know, stepping back for a minute and looking at your Twitter stream and going, wow, mm -hmm. did I really say that? Why did I retweet that? Why, you know, why am I picking on that candidate when it's totally pointless anyway? It's going to lose. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. there's, there's all of that. Um, it, it goes back to, okay, take a breath before you hit send and mm -hmm. read it. And then every once in a while, I'll go back and look and say, okay, what kind of picture am I putting out there of the brand or of yourself? Um, and does that really represent who I am? Yeah. Who the brand is. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to get too political here, but on the personal level, I think Trump is kind of like a mirror of what it's like to have an ego that is so you're so over identified with the ego that you don't have no clue that your ego is not you you know i mean that's yeah yeah 
Yeah, I think having some kind of, of self-understanding might be a really good thing in a presidential candidate. Sans, <laughs> Sans, Sans. <laughs> but, it, you know, we, we just, and, and I'm reading this book um, by Ming Tung from, um, he was, the oh, is he the Google guy? Yeah, and he wrote yeah. a book called, uh, I'm going to forget the name of it, um, Joy. Joy on Demand. Okay. And it's just, amazing because he really talks about how presence and being present and paying attention can help you understand you know where the joy is in your life and where the joy isn't and why it isn't there right now mm -hmm. if that makes any sense at all um yeah i read search inside yourself mm -hmm. but that that one sounds really good yeah it's pretty good I've, i'm i'm halfway through it but uh you know it's it's really I think there's a lot of things that we do to keep ourselves busy because mm -hmm. we want to be busy when actually we could be spending time making ourselves better, but we're too busy yeah. being busy and wasting that, just throwing that time out the window. Right. So, right. And I think, you know, with the whole social media thing, like I said, I'm like, Oh, I, I just hooked and I respond a lot. But that, yeah, being much more mindful about that is like, don't just respond to respond. Mm. Respond if you really have something to say. I mean, sometimes it's nice to respond to give thanks or props to someone, but um, I think that's a kind of busyness too. Mm. Um, it's just constantly, yeah responding because oh oh i have something to say but then what you have to say maybe is like well duh <laughs> or you know <laughs> like how valuable is the response that you're giving right and are you <laughs> saying something just to get your foot in the door or are right. you saying something because you actually have something to say yeah yeah right and i do think a lot of, of marketers will be the get your foot in the door you know i i mean yeah i would say in my early days of fanaticism with social media. I probably did that. You know, I, I actually, I re I even tweet, like when I notice some celebrity, like likes my tweet or something, it's like, oh, I still get that little adrenaline hit. Like we all used to get in yeah. the really early days when you got a lot of likes or something. <laughs> but I think, yeah, in, in work, I want to try to be much more mindful and go back to those goals and values and yeah, because I, I do think that, you know, I and mean, we've kind of been trained to do that, especially with things like Twitter, where, you know, if you tweet now in, what, three minutes, it's going to be gone. You mm. know, people don't see it. So a lot of brands feel like they have to tweet all the time yeah. and, you know, keep in front of people, no matter whether it's important or not. Um, right. You know, and, and that's not that's not really true. Um you know, there's saying something of value that gets retweeted by a hundred people is something that, you know, would have a lot more value to you than one. I'm just trying to stay busy and stay in your feed tweet. <laughs> yeah. 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 And for me, I think having to be mindful of my time too, I can't go down those rabbit holes. Let's see what Kathy's saying. We're all realizing it's the closer relationships that matter. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and help us achieve our goals. It's really, you know, and, and Kathy's a good example of that. Uh, you know, it's it's about creating networks of people that are valuable to you both as, as humans and also as business connections. And, you know, whatever your goals are for how you use social media, you know, really thinking about those relationships and, you know, I... I think a lot of people now are purging their social networks because there's mm -hmm. so much crap out there. And yeah. you know, you followed somebody because somebody else followed them or they had one message that they put out that you liked. But mm -hmm. then after that, they didn't say anything that was of value to you and they didn't engage. Well, get rid of them. Do you do that I on do. a like a regular basis or I would oh well, I try to. Or well, semi regular yeah. <laughs> Twitter and Facebook or Yeah, and it isn't just it isn't just, you know, because people disagree with me. That's fine. I don't mind if you disagree with me, but say something intelligent. Don't just be a troll. I mm -hmm. ban trolls at the drop of a hat. 
is somebody sends me a direct message on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn and it's a sales pitch before they've, you know, bought me a drink. Yeah. No, yeah. Fine, you're gone. I don't have time for that. Yeah. So I tend to do it more uh, actively, I guess, than proactively. I wait until somebody's, you know, been bad. Right. <laughs> and then I'll right. them. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. <laughs> yeah. But Kathy yeah. says the ones that overlap between personal and business are really sweet. And that's absolutely true. You know, creating a circle of friends that uh, can support you in what you do in business. Huge. Absolutely mm. huge. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, this has been really fun, Laura, and I really appreciate you taking the time. And, you know, we had some scheduling issues, but it looks like it all worked out. So that's yeah, great. And uh, I, I really appreciate your time. Why don't you tell people where they can find you? Oh, let's see. Um, let's uh, at L-N-O-R-V-I-G on Twitter. And yeah, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, that's it. I'm not really... I, I have to be honest, uh, I'm living the stereotype. I haven't really gotten the hang of Snapchat yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, do you snap? You know, I did <laughs> snap and I really didn't find it very useful. And yeah. now I just moved to Instagram. <laughs> I'll just, yeah. I'll just yeah. do stories on Instagram <laughs> yeah. and not very many of those. Right. Most right. of them are about my horse anyway, so nobody cares. <laughs> Your <laughs> <laughs> and what about etr it's etr.org uh, it it yep www.etr.org and um etr at etr associates great and uh twitter etr uh etr associates let's see cool i can use this little chat thing can i yeah <laughs> <laughs> And thanks, Kathy. I think my horse is awesome, too. <laughs> so it's ETR at ETR Associates. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. This is our second show on Crowdcast. But we're going to stay here. I'm, I'm liking the platform. I think there's a lot that we can do with it. It's stable and it's paid. So it's probably not going to go away as quickly as Blab did, which I kind of right. Miss. Yeah, poor Blab. <laughs> no revenue stream there, huh? Right. right. Oh. They, well, and they, they said we will have no revenue stream. That was the one thing that they promised from the beginning. Well, that's what happens <laughs> when you do that. Yeah. Uh, great people and, and really good stuff. But I'm glad to be yeah. on Crowdcast, and I'm loving the platform. So yeah. thanks, guys. Yeah, well, thank you for trying new things. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> All right. Well, take care. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.